beautiful. There was a man named Jesse. He and his wife had eight sons. Three of those older boys were away fighting a war, and unfortunately, that war was not too many miles away. There was a young brother, the very youngest of all the sons. His name was David. As young sons often are prone to be experiencing, and I was one of those, I was boy number seven. Uh, he did all the errands. He did all the jobs the others didn't want to do. He tended the sheep. He ran the errands. And one day his father called him and said, I want you to go and take some dinner, some food to your brother's. And take this gift of cheese to their commanding officer. That couldn't hurt. And find out how they're doing and bring back some assurance to me. When David got there, he found the battlefield like so many battlefields in that day. Two opposing armies facing each other so closely that they could hear each other. And between them was a valley, a mountain here, a mountain here, and kind of a plains in between. And for 40 days, they had been aligned like that because, you see, the strategy in that day was to try to get the other side to attack because if you could stay in the mountain that you were in, you could protect yourself better. If somebody had to come across the plain to you, well, they were more exposed and you had an advantage. And so they taunted each other and they shouted to each other and called each other's cowards and said, your mother wears army boots or whatever they did to get them to sort of come across the, the plain toward them. And no one was buying that. And so for 40 days, they stood there facing each other. But the Philistines had a kind of an edge in that 40-day war of psychology for they sent out each day, twice a day, 80 times a man named Goliath. And David got there just as the soldiers were on each side were shouting to each other and psyching each other up and saying whatever they said. And then suddenly there was a hush and a quiet as Goliath for the 80th time entered that plain. In front of him was a shield bearer, a man carrying a shield some six feet tall, maybe three or four feet wide. Goliath himself stood six feet, nine inches tall. He wore armor that weighed 125 pounds. The shaft of his spear was big like a weaver's beam. The point on that shaft weighed 16 pounds, the same weight as a shot put. Frankly, I think the man was on steroids. <laughs> and he would come out and for 40 days, twice a day, he had shouted to the Israelites and had said, come and fight me, somebody fight me and we'll settle this thing right now. And if I win, we win the war. If, if you win, you win the war, but somebody come fight me. Is there anyone here who has that courage? And that had so demoralized those people in the Israel army that when he showed up on this time, they literally ran, says Samuel, 1 Samuel 17. They literally turned and ran in fright. David saw this. And the word had been circulated by King Saul, I will give to anyone who kills this Philistine, I will give great wealth, my daughter's hand in marriage, and your father will never have to pay taxes again as long as he lives. David just walked in. He had heard these things. He went to one of the soldiers and said, Now, now what, what did the king say he would do? And uh, have you seen the king's daughter? <laughs> and David's big brother. Now, we learned in 1 Samuel 16 that Eliab was the most impressive looking of all of Jesse's boys. He was tall and impressive, more impressive than anyone else. In fact, David was so little impressed in his family or impressive in his family, they didn't even invite him to the meeting where they were looking for someone in the family to give great honor to. But Eliab, that big brother, saw David talking to the soldiers. And, you know, we don't know what triggered him. It could be the fact that his little brother had seen him run and cower before Goliath. 
It could be all the frustration of 40 days of being ready for fighting and, and not fighting and all this humilia humiliation and all this demoralizing effect that Goliath had had upon the whole army. But anyway, the word says that his, his anger burned within him. He was extremely angry at David and said, What are you doing here? Who's taking care of that handful of sheep? That's your biggest responsibility in life is to look after a few little sheep. And he not only belittled him, but he slandered him. He said, I know you. You're vain. You're self-centered. And you're here just to see us embarrassed. David looked at him, and Scripture doesn't say, but I think he smiled. And then went and talked to another soldier and said, what, what did the king say about you'd, what you'd get if you killed the Philistine? And have you, have you seen the king's daughter? Well, word got back to Saul that David was asking these questions and uh, he was the only applicant for the job. And so the king sent for him to talk to him. And when he saw him, he said, son, you can't do this. Why, you're just a boy. And this Goliath is a trained warrior besides being so big and strong. You have no chance at all to do this. And David looked at him and said, well, in taking care of my father's sheep, I fought other large animals. I killed lions and bears. And the same Lord who enabled me to destroy the lion and the bear will help me destroy this animal on the battlefield too. And Saul let him do it. That's the most amazing thing. Saul let him do it. He tried to put his armor on him. He tried to dress him up in Saul's armor. Saul said, you know, I've been reading uh, the Israeli Gentleman's Quarterly, and this is what it says every well-dressed warrior is wearing into battle this year. And you, you wear this, and, and it'll be good. For and David put it on, and he couldn't wear it. Don't ever try to fight your battles with somebody else's equipment. He took it all off and he just wore his regular clothes. The clothes he wore to tend the sheep in. I suppose today you might think it was a solid rock Jerusalem t-shirt. A pair of bugle boys. I don't know what he was wearing. Just the regular clothes he wore. And, and he walked out on that battlefield. And would you get the picture? Six foot, nine inch Goliath. Now the average height in that day was five one. Six feet, nine inches of Goliath. Big bronze headgear blazing in the sun. Shield bearer in front of him. The only exposed place on that whole man's body was right here. David walked out there wearing the regular clothes he wore when he tended the sheep, carrying a shepherd's staff. Kind of for effect, I think. And it worked. Because we read that Goliath said to him, D Do you think I'm a dog? that you can come, to me with, come at me with a stick? David had in his hand his secret weapon. It was an M1 short-range small ballistic missile launcher <laughs> called a sling. Uh, two leather strips, you remember, tied to a little wider piece of leather that, that had a, just enough room to cradle a small rock in it. You would tie one of those strips around your forefinger, at least I used to, and, or around your wrist, and you'd sling it above your head, and when you'd let it go, it would throw rocks with thrust. Now, I, I made and wore out at least five of those when I was growing up in the country, and I don't remember. Well, I do remember the two times I had a great time of rejoicing because I hit the target. They were very difficult to use. No one used them in that day in battle because all battle was close at hand. Well, David had five rocks he'd put in his shepherd's bag. And as he approached Goliath, and as Goliath started moving toward him, David ran toward Goliath and, and with one flick of the wrist let that rock go and it embedded the giant's face right here and killed him. Now, the conversation they had had leading up to that, David said to Goliath, you come against me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty. In verse 47, the battle is the Lord's, he said. And in verse 50 we read, so David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone without a sword in his hand. He struck down the Philistine and killed him. And the battle was won. The enemy was routed. This was the first step in David becoming the greatest king Israel ever had. This great day, 
came walking up looking like any other day. It's the way it happens, isn't it? The great days, the days of giant opportunity, the days of giant failure, they come looking like any other day. This was just a young man whose daddy asked him to go take some lunch to his brothers at the battle. That's all. This wasn't planned, except in God's mind. This was one of those days that comes incognito, great days in life, powerful days, and yet all of his life, David had really been preparing for that day. Everything leading up to this time had gotten him ready for that day. Because, you see, he was prepared. He was ready. The preparation was in his heart. Do you understand it's what's inside you that really counts? People would look at Goliath and David and say, this one is the strong one, this one has no chance. But you see, it's the size of the heart that matters. It's what's inside your heart that really counts. It's who you are that means how strong you are and what you can do. David had prepared his heart. In 1 Samuel 16, we read that when Samuel had come looking for this one that God would anoint later, God said to him, this tall, impressive alive is not him, nor any of the rest of the boys. The one they didn't even invite to the meeting is the one I want. Why? Because his heart is totally mine. His heart is sold out to me, said God, more than anyone else in all this country. Pounds and inches didn't matter. That's not strength. What matters was what's inside the heart. I remember convincing myself in high school I was too small to play football. So I didn't play. I just let football go. I, I didn't think I had a chance. I wasn't large enough to play football. When I moved into the athletic dorm at Texas A&M University, one of my sweet mates was the leading rusher in the Southwest Conference. He was my size. We wore the same clothes. We had to wear uniforms at that military school. We could actually wear each other's clothes all the way down to a shoe size. He was the same weight, the same size, the same everything, and I thought I was too small to play football, and he was one of the best in the country because the heart was in him. Burning desire, the heart was there. It's what's inside your heart that really counts. David was prepared. It was in his heart. You see, a wonderful thing happened to David while he was growing up. He got to spend hours alone. It's a wonderful thing to get to spend hours alone and yet not be lonely. And he learned that. His parents would send him out on these long journeys to stay with those sheep hour after hour after hour. He took his slingshot with him. He practiced that thing with hundreds and hundreds of throws a day until he could order and speak every rock to go exactly where he wanted it to go. But he also took his harp with him, his little ten-stringed harp about that size. He learned to play that thing well. He learned to sing well. And he composed songs. And he sang songs to his sheep and to his Lord. And those songs indicated what was in his heart. You see, the book of James tells us that the mouth is a dead giveaway. Jesus Christ in Matthew 12 said the mouth is a dead giveaway. It tells you exactly what's inside you. What comes out of your mouth is what's in your head and in your heart, and that's the real you. So the kind of songs that came out of David's mouth, his head, and his heart were, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I have nothing to fear. The Lord is my shepherd. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. These are the thoughts and the words that reverberated in his mind. These were the songs of his heart. What songs reverberate in your minds? What is the message of the music of your life? It's what's in your heart that counts. And David spent those hours alone and in quiet, and learn to know his Lord God and to know him well. I think one of the reasons of the unexplainable fact that in history, the people who do well don't keep it. The nations that prosper lose it. And I think it's because we lose the power of our heart, the quiet that we need to renew our hearts, 
when our technology fills us with thoughts and keeps bombarding us with somebody else's thoughts and somebody else's ideas and corrupting us and we let this junk get in our heads, we lose our hearts. We lose the power that comes from that kind of heart preparation that makes the difference. David was prepared. God said, I own his heart more than any other person in all of Israel. He was ready. And because he was ready, because he had this wonderful preparation, he had fantastic perception. He could see things as they really were. David always could see people when he looked at them. And he could see events when he looked. He had a wonderful kind of perception. And on this day, he shows that. In this charged atmosphere, in this battleground atmosphere, when it's imminent that some people, maybe hundreds of people are going to die. You, you can imagine what it was like in that place and, and with all the negative vibrations around him, with all the demoralize, demoralization that Goliath had brought a, upon that group of people, upon, with all the anger and every frustration, all of it was there. This man had a great perception. His brother wanted to fight. His brother, probably from being tensed up and ready to fight for 40 days and having nobody to fight, was ready to fight this young brother whom somehow he, he despised. He was ready to fight. But David knew you don't win life's big battles when you fight your brother. You've got to decide which fights are worth fighting. David was a warrior. Chapter 16 told us he was already recognized as, at his young age as a, a brave warrior. And yet... He didn't fight at the drop of a hat. He didn't fight just every battle that came along. He understood that there are some battles worth fighting. There are other battles that shouldn't be fought, and you don't ever fight a brother or a sister. You don't fight like that. And so he didn't. And he also kept his positive attitude in that spirit of negatives, bad vibrations and anger. He stayed positive. Everybody told him he couldn't do it. Nobody elected him the most likely giant killer among the group. His brother said, you don't even deserve to see a battle, much less be in one. King Saul said, boy, you can't do this. There's not a chance in the world for you if you go against Goliath. But David somehow remembered his victories and disregarded the negatives. He had a positive kind of spirit in his life, and this is shown in many ways, but it mostly is shown in him saying to the king, when I fought the lion, the Lord was with me. When I killed the bear, the Lord was with me. Today, the Lord will be with me. He saw the Lord, and he kept his positive spirit and his positive attitude. And he walked into victory. And when we're prepared, we're able to have the kind of perception that sees what's worth doing, what's right, what's good, what can be done when others say it can't. And there's power with that. It leads to power. Tell me, if you had seen that battle that day, if you were looking at that and you saw Goliath, 6'9", 125 pounds of armor, confident, Soldier who's killed many, many people before in battles like this. Young David, no armor, no sword, nothing but a stick in his hand, five rocks in his bag and a slingshot. If you're one of those idiot people who bets, who would you bet on? Who would you bet on? Where do you think the power would be if you looked at that? You see, there is in our world a Goliath illusion. There is the appearance of power that is not power. There is the appearance of strength that is not strength. It's amazing to me how we, we're always, in, in this land, we're always overestimating our enemies. Maybe that's safe, I don't know, but we're always thinking that that nation is so powerful they're about to run us over, then all of a sudden they, they just fall from within. The Goliath illusion, the Goliath illusion. David was the one who had the power. Power was in his heart. Power was in his character. Power was because the Lord God had him. There was power. 
You know the most amazing thing in this story? The most amazing thing in this story is that Saul let him do it. Do you realize that? Do you know what was at stake? If David had been killed by Goliath, and who would have thought that he wouldn't have been? Then King Saul would have been the first one to be captured and beheaded. They did that in those days. Many of the army would have been killed. The nation would have lost its freedom. All of this was at stake, and Saul let him do it. Why? Well, I think as David talked about the Lord was with me when I killed the lion and the bear, I think Saul saw in David something he used to have and lost. Saul saw the power of God in David. He saw the confidence in the Lord God Almighty in David. And he said, go, and God be with you. A word to you who are graduating, as you go, God be with you, and he will. To all of you, as you go into your world, go, and God be with you, and he will. You know God through Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And when you have the insight to spend the quiet time with him, to let him have your heart, to let him fill your soul, to let him be your God, then you will have perception and you will have power and you can go into anything, and God will be with you. Dear Lord, I thank you. I thank you for, for the preparation that can be made in Christ and in times with you. I thank you that you can give us a perception to know which battles are worth fighting and which one you want us to be a part of. I thank you, Lord, that whatever we go into, we can face with all the power of the God who defeated death behind us and know that we're walking in his strength. Lord, help us all to go wherever you send us because we know that you're with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please hear right now? I'm going to ask, unless there is an emergency, please no one leave. This is very, very important. You're standing in the presence of Almighty God. I want you to sit there and to make your decision as to what kind of person you would be under God. We're going to ask you to stay seated all during the invitation. And those of you who need to make public decisions, who need to come and ask Christ to come into your heart, those who need to come and say, I want to be a part of this church family, when the song begins, you stand up and come. All of us are here to make decisions. If you don't understand that, you don't understand worshiping Almighty God. And I pray your decision will be the one that pleases him today, whether it's public or not. But we invite you to come and make that public decision, and we'd be happy to meet you at the front as you do that. It's a joy to do that, always. But I pray you'll respond to whatever God would have you do. Right now, as we begin to sing, for public decisions, come quickly and let us rejoice with your decision. For all of us, let's reflect and make sure our heart belongs to God.